It is now time for us to hear from our special guest speaker. Our speaker this morning believes that many Toastmasters leave their clubs because of the fear caused by evaluations, not receiving them, giving them. For most of his 35 years in Toastmasters, his primary focus has been on providing and helping others provide effective evaluations. He's been recognized for his skill as the only three time winner of the District 30 Evaluation Speech Contest and a presenter of evaluation workshops like the one he'll do today at many district conferences and Toastmaster Leadership Institutes, also known as TLIs. Outside of Toastmasters, Stan uses his speaking and evaluation skills as the sales training and enablement specialist for Server Worldwide, the largest relocation company in the world. To help us learn how to create and deliver effective evaluations, please help me welcome with your applause icon or thumbs up or even in the screen, help me welcome Stan Piskorski. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Usually I like to jump right in, but I'd like to make one announcement before that, and that is you may interrupt at any time to ask a question, but I'm going to be looking at it one screen and I won't be able to see the chat room. So if you have a question, you want to say something, uh, you can make it known in the chat room and Cassandra will interrupt me, ask you to unmute and ask the question. So let's start with a question to all of you, and that is, can you see the screen? Can you see the, the um, yes, good, okay, great. Over the 35 years or so that I've been a member of Toastmasters, I have attended a ton of Toastmaster meetings. And one of the things I noticed about most typical Toastmaster meetings is that the prepared speeches are usually pretty good, even those that are done by relative newcomers. Table topics for most clubs are really enjoyable and a lot of people participate, but the weak part of the meeting is invariably the evaluations. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna look at Okay, we're going to look at our agenda is going to be why evaluations matter, how to deliver an effective evaluation, and what you can do to improve your evaluations. Now, I'm going to ask uh, the, the, the meeting host to unmute everybody because I want to ask a question and I want you to yell out your responses. Why do you think people join Toastmasters? To be better communicators. Excellent. Keep going. To fix bad habits. Okay. Get over their fear of speaking in public. Great. To be a better leader. Excellent. To help others. Okay. To be able to influence people. Be able to influence people. Good. So that's a good starting point for why people join Toastmasters. Over the years, I've come up with a list that's very similar to that. Um, one of the ones that you didn't mention was to address a specific communication concern, either English as a second language or a speech pathology issue. And some people actually want to become professional speakers. That's not generally speaking why most people get it, but some of us get the bug. Um, and, and a few of us like to have Toastmasters as a social outlet. But if you look at all of these reasons, almost every one of them requires some kind of effective feedback. Mm -hmm. The founder of Toastmasters, Ralph Schmidley, understood the value of feedback. Take a look at this quote from him decades and decades ago. And there's a, but there's a minor problem with the words he chose. 
It has to do with that definition of criticism. When you think of the word criticism, it has very strong connotations. In other words, it creates a reaction, an emotional reaction. I wanted to see if that was actually the case with the definition. So I looked it up in a number of dictionaries and son of a gun, it has that same feeling about it. It's about finding faults or judging. And some of you might say, well, yes, that's true. That's criticism, but we actually call our process evaluation. Okay, so let's look at the definition of evaluation. Still kind of has that feel of judgment, doesn't it? So I'm gonna suggest some better terms. I believe that Toastmaster evaluations actually consist of two things, feedback and coaching. And since we've been defining terms, let me define each of those. Feedback is the response, and I wanna make sure I'm clear on this. I, most times I won't read slides out. This one I'm gonna read. It's a response from a receiver that informs the sender how the communication is being received. So let's take that apart. From the receiver, which is the audience member, that informs the sender, which is the speaker, how the communication, the speech, is being received. And I define received as how it's seen, how it's heard, and how it's felt. Well, that's the first definition, feedback. Let's look at coaching. And when you think about the most common kind of coaches, athletic coaches, they do two things. They instruct their athletes what to do, how to do it, and why to do it so that their performance can improve. But because behavior can, change can take a long time, they also need to provide encouragement to continue to improve. So now that we understand what the definition is of Toastmaster evaluation, let's take a look at the different roles that are played in this process. If you think about it, the speaker's job is pretty simple. It's to communicate effectively with every member of the audience. But the evaluator actually has a tougher job. They have three specific things. One is to inform the speaker how he or she communicated either effectively or ineffectively. Another part of their job is to provide recommendations, either how to change ineffective behaviors or how to maintain those behaviors that are effective. And finally, there's that piece of encouragement, encouraging pe people to, to continue to work on improving their effectiveness as a speaker, just like that athletic coach. Now, a good question you might ask right now is who really benefits from this coaching and feedback? Well, I like to think about the fact that the speaker obviously benefits. So, so WIIFM, what's in it for the speaker? We've all heard that practice makes perfect, but it's not really true. Practice makes permanent. If you practice the piano and you play the song wrong, it's going to be permanently wrong. But perfect practice makes perfect. So to improve, so what we also have to do is, for the benefit of the speaker, is to give them feedback because unless they're recording themselves on one of these Zoom meetings, uh, they can't see themselves as they're speaking. So we have to give them feedback because performance requires feedback. And if they're gonna get better and improve, they need to get encouraged. So the question then is, if that's what's in it for the speaker, what's in it for the evaluator? Well, if you, if you really think about the role of the evaluator, by being an evaluator helps them become a better speaker and a speech writer. Let me explain that with the use of a quote that I found 
to be particularly helpful. And I can tell you this is absolutely true. If I want to master something, teach it. I've learned more about speaking by teaching evaluation than I ever did by just speaking. Now, that's the two people that are most involved in the evaluation pro process. The question is, what's in it for the others, the observers of the evaluation and the speech, or the club members? Well, by watching both the speech and the feedback, the rest of the members of the club also become better. They become better speakers, better speech writers, and better coaches. Now, some people think people be, that being an evaluator is an easy role in a Toastmaster meeting because it doesn't require any preparation. That's actually false. The biggest mistake you can make as an evaluator is being unprepared. Think about those athletic coaches and what they do between games. They look at the previous performance, the game films, game films, and they plan for the next game. So in Toastmasters, there are two kinds of preparation that can happen in order to give effective feedback and coaching. The specific kind of feedback or the specific preparation has to do with the individual project. You know, these days, well, all this stuff is available online used to be when we had those workbooks, for those of you who have been around long enough, we'd have people prepare by looking at like a three, a, a three bullet points uh, goals of the project. Um, that's not really a good way to prepare the specific goals. And the other thing is to look at the specific goals of the speaker. But we're not gonna go deep dive into the specifics. We're looking at the general preparation for the evaluation. And the two things that are important there is the evaluation process and what I call a recommendation repertoire. Let's take a look at actually delivering an evaluation speech. What is the topic of the speech? Well, the topic of an evaluation speech is what speech has just been observed by a previous speaker. In our format, we have two to three minutes. It's structured, and traditionally what we especially have done in District 30, we talk both to the speaker and to the audience. And it should be in the first person. By that I mean that you should look at it from your perspective because you're the only one that can speak about their reaction to the speech. The focus is on performance improvement. It's either what the same, sometimes we have the same speech again, or sometimes we're just looking at the skills that someone learns in order to make, make future speeches even better. The feedback that you can give, the only feedback that you can give is what you saw, what you heard, and what you felt. Now, once you've gotten once you've looked at what you saw and what you heard and you felt, you're able to answer three key questions that every speech maker wants to hear from their evaluator. Those three questions are what, why, and how. Let me explain how those questions get answered. The first thing we wanna know is what was effective and what was ineffective. Now you'll notice I don't say what are strengths or weaknesses, because for every individual, certain things are effective or ineffective. And we'll dive in deeper to this in just a few minutes. The second thing, the, the second question that, wants, that the speaker wants answers is why it was effective or why it was ineffective. What caused it to work or not work from the perspective of that listener? And finally, they wanna know, how to use it more if it was effective or how to change it if it was ineffective. So with this as a backdrop, let's take a look at the actual structure of an evaluation speech. The opening is pretty simple, the Toastmaster ritual. 
I always like to say to open with the Toastmaster ritual simply to make sure that people are paying attention. So, Madam General Evaluator, Mr. General Evaluator, Mr. Toastmaster, Madam Toastmaster, or if you're in a speech contest, Mr. Contest Master or Madam Contest Master, fellow Toastmasters and guests, and most importantly, and then you would name the speaker while looking at them. Now, the other thing I like to do is to connect with the speaker. Something that they said in their speech that causes me to, say, to let the speaker know I was truly listening. Let me give you an example. You know, I really enjoyed your speech about visiting France. It's some place I've always wanted to visit. And these days, I just want to get out of the house. Then let's take a look at the body. This is the meat of the evaluation process. Now, when I look at the, what's in this piece, I look at two specific things. The mastery, behaviors that were effective. What did someone do that was effective in communicating with me? You know, speaking is a learned skill. None of us were born knowing how to say a single word. And so we continue to learn how to be better and better and better until we master certain behaviors. At the same time, there's always room for growth. So I, like I said, I don't like to talk about strengths and weaknesses. To me, it's about mastery and growth opportunities. Behaviors that were less effective can be changed in order to make them more effective. And because you only have two or three minutes, you wanna make sure that you can pick two or three of each one. Now, this is something that a lot of people have difficulty with, and I'm gonna recommend a model that will help when you're trying to deliver this presentation. By the way, I do have one suggestion, and that is if you're evaluating an icebreaker, instead of picking two or three, just pick one thing that, that, that the speaker did that, effect, that was mastery, even if it's just getting up to make the speech. And one growth opportunity, one thing that shows how they're going to benefit from their involvement in the Toastmaster organization. So let's take a look at how you might give that feedback. I like to talk about the ORS model for giving feedback and coaching. So the first part is observation. What is it I saw that was either saw or heard um, in the presentation. The second part is the reaction. What caused, what, what, based on what I saw or what I heard, what was my reaction to that? You know, a lot of times speeches elicit emotional responses and we wanna take a look at whether or not that happened. And finally, the, the coaching section is the suggestion. So, it's one thing to give you this model, but let's give you some examples of how to do this. Here's what observation might sound like. Sorry. Um, observation is what you saw and what you heard. Uh, remember I said you can only speak for yourself, but you can observe and report on the audience reaction. So for example, you can't say something like, oh, we all thought that joke was funny, because you can't read minds. But what you can say is, I observed a lot of people laughing, and as a result, it's clear that you were effective in telling a humorous story or a joke. So let's take a look at what it might, say, what it might how you might start your observations. When you did such and such, I noticed when you gestured, I saw that you, I heard you say, or when you said. So these, the more specific you can be, the better you're going to be able to help that person recognize what it is they did that was either effective or ineffective. And this is the way to introduce what your observation is. Now let's take a look, say, and you have to be as specific as possible. Um, so that the, the evaluator or the speaker knows what it is you were referring to. Now we want to take a look at the reaction. 
Remember, a lot of times there's an emotional response. So the reaction is either how you felt, why, why that action was effective or ineffective, and what emotion that it triggered. Could be a lot of different ones. Now, uh, there's lots of reasons that you might have for your reaction. Perhaps you had a similar experience and therefore you identified with it. Or there's some sort of a, of a background that you have that causes you to have that specific thing. Case in point, I noticed that a lot of men say things that are sexist without even knowing that they've said sexist things. And so if, if you've identified something that a male speaker has said that's sexist, that will help you uh, talk about why you reacted in a certain way. Let me give you some examples of what that would sound like. I was drawn in when you did this. You know, I was lost when you went off on a tangent about your trip to Germany while you were describing your trip to France. I felt disconnected because you know, I almost felt like crying when you told that story about the hurt puppy dog. I laughed out loud when you mentioned that, we won't go into why you might have laughed outside. The audience laughed, I heard some chuckles, or I was offended become, from. Now this is where we have some really real examples of bad reactions from the evaluator. This is what reaction does not sound like. Oh, that was good. But gosh, that was terrible. You know, it was really excellent. Or that was poor. Those descriptions don't help. They're not specific. And so I re strongly recommend that you avoid those kinds of comments whenever you possibly can. Now let's talk about suggestions. Specific actions the speaker can take to be more effective. And you can even include ideas on how to, use, how to increase the use of effective behaviors. For example, if someone used an acronym that was particularly effective, you could say, gee, it was particularly effective to me when you use that acronym because I was able to remember it later on through the entire speech. I suggest that you use other acronyms when you're speaking about complex topics in the future. And here's what suggestions would sound like. Try this, explore that, do this. It might work if you had done this. One thing I want to make clear here, do not be afraid of your suggestions. I often hear people when they give a suggestion say, well, you know, that's just my idea. Uh, you know, it's just a little thing. Have some confidence. You're there to watch and observe and give your reaction. You have the right to have that reaction and not to undermine it with some sort of, of safe phrase like, well, it's just a little thing. So let me give you an example of what that might sound like in the real world. I noticed you were averting your eyes from the audience. As a result, I felt disconnected from you. One technique I've tried is to think of the room as individuals instead of a group. And I look at one person for a few seconds and then look at a different person. On your next speech, I recommend you try that technique. There are some things you can do when you're making suggestions that might help the speaker remember. For example, you might be able to model the suggestions. Let me give you a couple of examples of how to model it and maybe even naming the tip. How many of you have ever seen, and I'm not gonna be able to watch and see how many of you respond to this, um, when a speaker gestures very, very close to their body up like this, and all their hand gestures are right here. I call that T-Rex hands. Is that a vivid description so that you get an idea of what I'm talking about, T-Rex hands? There's another one that I call the machine gun delivery. That's when a speaker says a few words at a time 
and then pauses between the groups of words. It's like a machine gun who goes rat-a-tat, 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 tat, tat. If I were standing, I would put my hands in front of my, in front of my private parts, and that's known as the fig leaf. I used to call it when you put your hands behind your back, the reverse fig leaf, but I got a much better idea from someone who called it handcuffs. So these are some tips that people have uh, that are vivid names for the kinds of suggestions you might make. Now, you know, I've been talking here for quite a while. And what I would like you to do is to unmute yourself. Someone would, uh, each one of you gets a chance and try it with me. What is the behavior I've done that you've observed? What was your reaction to that behavior? And what kind of a suggestion would you make? It's okay. Now, I'm not going to be able to see the hands or anything, so Cassandra, would you be so kind as to identify someone or just have someone speak out and let me know who you are by voice? To ask the audience a question, expected answers. Becky, can you say that again for Stan? Yeah, this is Becky. You asked a, you asked a specific question and expected us to answer. And Oh, that's just the observation. So that's the observation. What was your reaction to that? <clears throat> My reaction was um, I wanted to, it made me think about what the question, what my answer was. Okay, so it caused you to think through, do you have a suggestion that you would make either for me to continue doing it or to change the behavior? I would suggest that you continue to do it. I thought I would try that sometime. <laughs> Okay, so what we're often good at is the observation, but not the reaction and the suggestion. How about if someone else tries some, based on what you've seen me do or what you've heard me say, what was your observation, your reaction, and your suggestion? You can either unmute yourself or give me the thumbs up, that way visually I can see you. Thank you, Cassandra. Well, I thought, can you hear me? Yes, Freedom, go ahead. Uh, you talk very, um, <clears throat> you take your time when you speak. I think that is a good thing. But at the same time, some may, it might, yeah, I'm trying to hold back now. <laughs> uh, it sometimes maybe it can drag on. Whatever your, your, the whole, um, and your suggestion? Uh, I would say continue to do it, but maybe be a little bit faster. So let me see if I'm understanding what you're saying. You observe that my pace is relatively consistent and slow, and that made it difficult for you to stay focused. Is that correct? Uh, no, I was focused. I just, I would think for uh, somebody who, I don't know, may have ADHD or something, they might, uh, they might zone out. So it's possible that someone would zone out and you would like me to perhaps vary my spe speaking speed and increase it to make it easier for people who would zone out. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So you see that once again, we've got this three-part process. This is the hard part of evaluation. What is your reaction? Because the speaker, remember, the goal of the speaker is to communicate effectively with every person in the audience. So you have to tell them what your reaction was, not just what you observed. And then you have to make a suggestion so they can either reinforce and do that behavior again or change that behavior. That's a pretty difficult thing to do, but we're gonna get an opportunity. Um, so let me continue on the, the, the speech structure uh, and then we're gonna try it out. The final piece of the piece of the, of the structure is the closing. Now, I believe uh, many of us have seen in Toastmaster things, they talk about the sandwich. 
where you say, well, here's something that was good, here's something that wasn't good, and here's something good again. The reality is the sandwich evaluation is awful because it presents a mixed message. At the same time, there is a reason to have a, a sandwich where you say, here are the things that you did that were effective, here were the things that you did that were ineffective, and then the final part, the other part of the sandwich, if you will, is to offer encouragement. I happen to use a common phrase, almost, a common sentence almost every time to offer encouragement, which is to say, I'm looking forward to hearing your next speech. Now, some people have said to me, well, that sounds kind of rehearsed. The reality is I really am looking forward to hearing their next speech because I want to find out whether anything I recommended actually made a difference. And then the final piece is a very simple Toastmaster ritual of ending by saying, Mr. General Evaluator, Madam General Evaluator. Now, we've talked a lot about the process of making a speech, and we're gonna hear a couple of speeches right now, and we're gonna, I'm gonna uh, I've explained the process here. Um, I've given you a handout of two forms. One of the forms is the form that is used by Windy City professional speakers. It's the one that has all the details about uh, words and gestures and all that, a lot of small print. And the reason for that, and the other is my personal form, and I'll explain that in just a minute. So if you think about that Windy City form, what we try to do at Windy City is we evaluate every speech on the basis of the building blocks that are common to every speech. So those building blocks are quickly reviewing, did the person connect with the audience? Did they use effective words? What did you learn about their voice? Was it effective? Was there a variety of pace, pitch, volume, that kind of thing? Were the gestures they use in sync with the message they were trying to communicate? <coughs> Excuse me. And if there were visual aids, did they use them effectively? Finally, we wanna take a look at how this was all put together in organization. And for those of us who are now presenting virtually, and that the final question to ask, and this is not part of what's on any of the forms, but we're now looking at it, and that is, how did they manage the video technology? Did they do a good job? How did they either, how were they effective or ineffective in using the video technology? The second form is the one that is my personal form, because I've already memorized all of these aspects of a speech. And so I simply look at what are the three things I observed that needed to, where I thought were ineffective and what were my recommendations? And then what were the things that I thought were effective and what were my recommendations? So once you've gotten all these building blocks under control, you don't need quite as much uh, prompting in order to figure out what, it, they, what the, uh, you're looking at. I might suggest trying to use some of these as you're observing our first speaker. So let me explain the next part of this presentation. We're going to listen to a speaker and then we're going to ask the evaluator to go into a separate room. They're gonna be, they're gonna be invited to go to a separate room and the evaluator will have time to create their evaluation. While they're creating their evaluation, I'm going to facilitate a conversation with the rest of the members of the club to find out what you observed and what your recommendations are. Then we're gonna invite the evaluator to come back in and give their two to three minute evaluation and compare and contrast. Then we'll do that with the second speaker also. Everyone clear?